takes you to Shurao, a sleepy island along the Mandovi River in the north of Goa, a secluded place enveloped in dense mangrove forests. And nestled amongst these mangroves is a surprising resident. The elusive smooth-coated otter, scientifically known as the Lutrigal perspicillata. I've been working in Goa now for just over a year and I think I've seen otters maybe 12 times. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how hard it is to actually spot an otter. Wild Otters Research, a wildlife research organization based in Shurao, was founded in 2014 with the aim to study and work towards the conservation of otters. The little animals known to inhabit most of the waterways and coastal areas of Goa. For the last six months, the organization has been tracking an estimated six to seven otter family groups in Shurao. Each group is estimated to have anything between three to eight members. In other regions, it is believed the group sizes could be double or even triple that number. We have a field base in Karnataka. We focus there on the Asian small claw otter. Most of the work in the field base on Sharao is uh, focused on the smooth coated otter. We do work uh, in Goa as well on the small claw otter. Being an elusive species, otters have mostly been studied in captivity. Aiming to bridge this gap, wild otters research is studying, among other things, the reproductive behavior of these animals in the wild and highly productive environment of the mangrove ecosystem. In 2017, we have evidence of pups being born in May, which is contradictory to all the historical data. Now, is that because this is a highly productive environment where, you know, animal, where there's a fish supply throughout the year and there's no problems with that? Is, is that the reason they've, they've had, you know, pups at that time of the year. Focused on addressing these data gaps, a typical day at Wild Otter starts off with looking for signs of water sites. So right here is typically where uh, there's a lot of otter activity. Uh, this right here, this whole thing is a defecating area um, and this is a grooming spot so you can see that this sort of is wetter than the rest of the ground around here which potentially is an indicator that they've been up here, they've been grooming they, because they're wet when they come in. Um, so grooming is basically rubbing their body on the ground to get rid of the soil. Yeah. And then so we look for we look for other signs as well. We look for paw prints, we look for tail drag. So we're going to record this now. We're going to we're going to put this in as a recency three. So essentially what that means is on, on the data sheet we say recency three and then we take a GPS waypoint and um, and then what it's called, which is a defecating area. So we try and get away as much debris as we can. These could be paw prints, these could be 
you know, any sort of defecation areas, any dens. You make a note of that on the survey sheet. You collect any samples you want to analyze. You bring them back to the field base. The otter scat is then washed, dried, and the content is examined for signs of scales, fish bones, vegetation, and crabs, among other things. So, if you keep doing that for every otter uh, scat that you get, and if you have 200 otter scats, at the end of the day, you have a good percentage of what they're predominantly. Uh, consuming and then you can map that against uh, different seasons or uh, tidal patterns and things like that to get a better picture of what's going on. Apart from field surveys, camera traps are the other big source of information and data collection. You want to try that one? Camera traps are placed near defecation areas or dens and help to unearth behavioral data. It's like a good angle. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I think it will work. You're not getting the tree yes. here. But not too much of the um, sky because that can affect the light quality of our images. Right now we're putting camera traps in front of dens, which goes into our den usage project. Uh, we're trying to find out, for example, uh, in a given area, how many dens do otters have and how often they move between these dens. We are also trying to find out information about when they are going out, when they are coming in, in terms of going out to forage, go coming back home. Trying to find out how they behave with their pups uh, just after they have had their pups, so we know that the pups remain in the dens for the first month because their eyes haven't opened yet and then they learn how to go out and swim. And when the swimming lessons begin, we think that they're moving their dens to a different location. So the dens where they're born tend to be much higher and away from the water. And once they're learning to swim, they tend to go closer to the water. With focus often being on the mega charismatic species of animals, Wild Otters is hoping to bring awareness to the pivotal role smaller animals like the otters play in balancing the ecosystem. I'll give you an example on, on Sharao. For you. There is there's a number of commercial fish that go into the fishing pools. Um, and all, alongside that was something called the Madagascar tilapia, which was an introduced species. And this tilapia species was introduced into the waterways here because uh, they kind of predate on mosquito larvae. So to bring down the mosquito larvae, uh, mosquito populations, they brought in the fish and then they took over the ecosystem and started actually killing all native fish species. And then otters came along and even though they are not a native species, otters prefer them and have started eating them. So in a sense, they are now controlling an invasive species and allowing native species to come back and regenerate and have healthy populations. However, loss of habitats, water pollution, human-animal conflict and the trade in fur and body parts has resulted in the species being classified as vulnerable on the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List. Yeah, all these otters got finished over here, they moved on to Europe and in Europe what happened, it was they, the Eurasian otter which has the largest range, they were targeted for their fur as well as for um, recreational hunting. The live pet otter trade is essentially started because of the cuteness factor of otters which needs to be mediated. So there are different things happening in the pet trade. Uh, there's something called otter cafes that are in Japan where you can you know go in and have a coffee and then pay to pet an otter for a limited amount of time which is becoming very popular. Otters are wild animals, they are carnivores, they are apex predators that require to be in the wild and should not be in people's homes. Uh, they are very cute 
as most people would think and that is sold a lot in, in uh, media and then they grow and become wild animals and their instincts come out and then they bite and then they uh, cannot be handled at home, they need to have water as well as land they, and all of those sorts of requirements cannot be catered to in somebody's house. Um, so two things happen then, then they tried, people try to re-release them into the, into the wild which fails because they have no way of surviving or they just malnourish and maltreated till they die. <laughs> So every so often while they're grooming, one of the members will kind of stop and survey, make sure there's no threats near. This one looks good. A self-funded organization, <laughs> Wild Otters Research has still now trained more than 500 people in otter conservation and study through internships, workshops and training programs. Babies! A three-day workshop here would cost between $85 to $130, while a customized wildlife curriculum created for schools and colleges would cost about $30 a day for each student. You notice he's limping on his way down. And he's, you, can see the you can see, and he's also got puncture wounds all around his backside too. Despite all the threats, today, this little island of Shorao seems to have become home for these unexpected inhabitants, and the community hopes they will stay. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> Development is something that's just going to happen. Constructions is going to happen. Everybody needs a home. But at least things can be designed in a way where these species can live with us. As opposed to, you know, this is my area and this is that, your area. That's not something we want. It's, it's always going to be a case where people are going to live alongside these animals. And that's the key focus going on.